From the Basement, the only blockchain podcast that interviews the forgotten and downtrodden devs that actually do the work. Hosted by me, Martin G. Today, I've got Anka Banerjee here. Hello, Anka. Hi, Martin. <laughs> hey, Anka is head of engineering at IDWorks and uh, has recently become group head of engineering at the 2030 group. Uh, and he joined just before Christmas. Before that, he worked for Accenture as a solution lead for uh, blockchain and digital identity. Um, before that, you had a few little jobs and that was pretty much when you graduated. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and I think one of the most interesting ones there was working for a startup to control drones through web browsers. So you could log on to a oh. Google Maps like interface and uh, just tell a tiny drone to go from point A to point B and do whatever you wanted it to do. <laughs> oh, that is cool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. First up, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to rapid fire you a deck of questions. Okay. I think it'll be a good way to just get a sense of who you are and where you're coming from. Are you ready to do that? I'm ready. Born ready. <laughs> Let's go for it. Right. Um, what company do you work for? IDWorks. Well, what do you do there? And I am the head of engineering. Uh, what, does, uh, what do your parents tell people you do for a living? My parents tell I work in IT. Um, and I think <laughs> that's what all parents do. <laughs> yeah. um, what do you really do? I actually work on some very, very complex engineering problems on creating an entirely new way of sharing digital ID online. Um, do you have a nickname? No, I, I don't actually. How long have you been programming for? I've probably been programming since the age of 15. My first sort of like in a foray into it was uh, because I got really interested in Linux and tried to set up my own Linux servers when I was a kid. Uh, what, what got you into programming in the first place? Um, trying to set up my own website. And back in the day, that used to be GeoCities. Uh, where, where did you grow up? I grew up in a bunch of different places. So um, I was born in New Delhi, but I've lived uh, various parts of my life in Singapore, Thailand, bits, bits and bobs in other different countries, um, quite a bit in India. And then I've been in the UK for about like 10 years at this point. So, um, so tell me then, um, what came first for you, uh, digital ID or blockchain? So I got involved fairly early working on one of the largest biometrics deployments in the UK. Um, wow. And as part of that, I got connected up with this community of people within Accenture working on face biometrics, voice biometrics, fingerprint. Um, and really started understanding everything that goes into making uh, a, a sec secure and scalable system that ha handles people's digital identity. Um, side of desk at work, I got involved in the blockchain community within Accenture. Um, and um, within about sort of like, you know, two years, I got to work with Accenture's innovation lab team, um, which was focused on doing projects in new and emerging areas of technology. And my, my specialty there was blockchain. Uh, but at the same time, I was still doing digital identity projects. So for me, it's been a bit of a bit of a merger of like, you know, two things that I'm really interested in. Amazing. But yeah, first of all, what is digital ID? Because it does feel a bit nebulous, you know. Uh, so please, can you explain to, to me what digital ID is first? You have loads of different pieces of plastic or paper that you carry around um, that mm. are related to you. So this could be a land deed for the house that you own. It could be a credit card agreement with your bank. It could be your driving license. It could be your Oyster card, which doesn't have your name on it but it's something that uniquely is used by you as a person. So yeah. throughout our lives, we carry around these different pieces of paper or plastic. What happens online is if you had to tell somebody some information right now, you're probably just going on a web form that says, enter your name, enter your email address, enter your actual address and so on. And, and you fill yeah. out some forms that basically is digital identity. And the thing that's sort of curious about this is although like, you know, the internet and the web has existed for decades, there hasn't really been uh, an easy way to transfer that around. As an example, um, if you go on a website, you see this link that says login using Facebook or sign up using Facebook. 
And yeah. when you tap on that, if you have a Facebook account, it just goes to Facebook and says, you're going to transfer your name, your friends list and your email address and whatnot. Um, and you're able to sign up using one tap instead of trying to fill that information out. Yeah. But what's got me interested is um, there's a huge, huge sort of um, ethical and uh, thing to look out for on, on this problem. Because what we have done is over the past sort of decade, we, we've given over control of our data to companies like yeah. to Twitter, to Facebook, um, where they have become the hub of this information. Um, and even if even if you're not using sign up using Facebook or Twitter, you have this sort of like hamster wheel as uh, of of going and filling the same information again and again and again in in all yeah. of these different places. So you you got into blockchain and you said, mm -hmm. you said Ethereum around 2015. Mm -hmm. But what point did you get into Corda and um, and was there yeah what point and why did you get into Corda? You know, was there something particular? So I got into Corda um, probably around 2017 because um, I was faculty within Accenture for blockchain trainings that we gave mm. to uh, engineers and to um, like people, people even from management who wanted to get a hang of like what this whole blockchain thing was. Um, and, and I was teaching sections on Ethereum over there. Um, but I also got to meet faculty members from around the world who did other bits within Accenture. So some of them did Hyperledger Fabric, some of them did Corda. And Corda stood out to me as, as something quite radically different than what I already knew from Ethereum. Um, but even with the Ethereum model, I could, I could start seeing um, there might be scenarios when um, you want to keep some of the information private from others. Um, mm. And it was a good sort of like, you know, training in this that I, that I, uh, that I had. So a lot of people say the trust in the blockchain comes from having it distributed around to all people. Um, but what they often forget is if, for instance, if you take a commercial transaction, um, even if you could keep the information of like how much you're trading and what you're trading encrypted and, and hidden from others, you could just figure out what kind of commercial relationship people have by looking at how often two companies interact with each other. So are they a major supplier for say, uh, an oil and gas company because they're trading a thousand times a day instead of maybe smaller companies that are only trading five times a day. And I realized yeah. that was a problem on public blockchains because um, there was this very interesting story about um, how you could figure out uh, where somebody was spending Bitcoins by just following them around and noting down what time they were buying certain things at certain shops. So if you could figure mm -hmm. out where and how much they were spending and at what time, um, you could, for instance, search a public blockchain for all transactions of that kind. Um, yeah. And if you could figure out what address it was being used for, um, then you could potentially find out the entire history of, of what that person has been spending online. Um, things have yeah. moved on from, from, since then in, in public blockchains. There's, there's other ways of doing privacy on public blockchains now. Um, but it, but, but it, was, it, it, it sort of woke me up to this um, potential issue. Um, the, the other reason that got me interested was where some people took pornographic images um, <laughs> Co co converted it into some kind of encrypted text and then put it on the Bitcoin blockchain, which, which was, oh, which was to yeah. prove, um, Hey, now everybody who has a copy of the B Bitcoin blockchain has this copy of pornography. So how do you then tackle with jurisdictional issues? What if yeah. like that, what, what if yeah, that was illegal that. to hold, yeah. um, say, I don't know, in Saudi Arabia. So, I think there are some interesting challenges that I like came across at the time. And um, I'd really love to find out something else like Corda that has a different stance towards how privacy is handled. Mm. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, I mean, there's, there's a much, much bigger vision with Corda happening right now. I don't know how many of the listeners are familiar, um, but there's a thing right now called the Corda network. So if you go to Corda.network in your browser, you can go see it. Mm. Um, and, and it's basically like trying to create an internet or, or, or the highways through which 
different towns and cities could talk to each other. Um, so you could have like a tiny city of like oh, insurance right. blockchains and a tiny city of um, healthcare uh, and, and medical records blockchains. And then Corda Network creates this uh, link where you can go between these different cities. And I feel like a lot of the so people... Is that... Sorry, yeah, go on. Is that this Corda mainnet? Yeah, some companies, they deploy their nodes and cord apps to a private private Corda network, mm -hmm. you know, set up with, uh, I think it's uh, Corda NMS, mm -hmm. uh, or, or you can or you can put it on the quote unquote Corda mainnet. Is that the same thing or is that something different? Yeah, that is, a, that is exactly the same thing. So it's, it's a bit mm -hmm. like the private networks are like having a gated community where you know who's living in there and who's participating within that blockchain. And um, being on the mainnet is a bit like being a city where you could still have like city boundaries of whom you're generally dealing with, but then you have highways that you connect, connect you up to other cities. And I feel like a lot of people who saw Corda early on only saw this private gated community aspect of it and, and yeah. didn't really understand like, you know, the bigger vision. And I'd say to those people, like, you know, I have been there, I was there at 2017. When I, when mm. I first started looking at this, it was radically different. Um, you should give it a try now and, and, and see what this sort of like, you know, bigger sort of um, vision and expansion um, has, has enabled this kind of highways different between different um, yeah. things to take place. I don't know, it feels like we're missing out a big opportunity here. And it's obviously all about trust and everyone's still early days in the market and dabbling their toes, but I don't know maybe, how I don't know how R3 would solve that, but maybe maybe I'll have to eat my hat about this, but this is my prediction for like twenty twenty one. I Go would on. not be surprised if a lot of other quarter based startups uh, and quarter based companies had at least some link to the mainnet. Um, and the reason why I think a lot of them are on private right now is because it takes a long time to plan, develop and launch something. So mm. the stories that you hear now were probably designed, say, 18 months ago or, yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or further ago. And uh, especially with the bigger consortiums, we have to get like a yeah. lot of people to agree on stuff. Um, so. I, I would not be surprised if like a lot more of them like started allowing um, at least some sort of links between different networks or started interacting with other mm. networks more because yeah. that's where you really start getting value um, of, of, of using things. Um, all right. So talking about use cases and mm. can you tell us what ID works does? Ooh, so we're taking, uh, say, plastic ID cards and making a digital yeah. version of it. So that's, right. that's the easy explanation. Then here's the second bit. So you have, say, credit or debit cards, right, Martin? Mm -hmm. Yes. And then when you go into a shop, you don't necessarily care if it's a Visa or, or, or a MasterCard that you're holding because nope. any time that you pay within the shop, you just tap your card, you insert your card, and, and, and you've paid. What's happening in the background is... Uh, the card machine is going and talking to Visa or MasterCard, the network, which talks to your bank. It checks if you have enough money in your account, um, comes back and tells the card machine that, that you have the money. That happens in, in fractions of like a millisecond. So we want to enable something similar. When you take your digital ID card to someone, um, it shouldn't matter whether they are on, on, on Corda or Hyperledger Indie or any other blockchain. We want to enable okay. you as a customer to be able to present your digital ID, regardless of what blockchain it's based on um, and being able to present that somewhere else. And we are building the software so that the companies that you deal with every day as a, as, as a customer, they can accept this uh, digital ID card from you. How on earth, how on earth is that even possible? <laughs> uh, it's the same way that you have multiple, maybe credit or debit cards in your wallet. Um, we right. build some software that allows you to store this information. Credit cards use, use the same set of standards. And in digital ID, we also have standards. Um, there's one called verifiable credentials. And really? there's another one called decentralized ID. Yep. As of last year. And it's from the same, uh, it's from something called the World Wide Web Consortium. And oh, yeah. this is like 
the Illuminati of the internet. <laughs> we don't want to build our own app because I don't think people want to download more apps. So we're building software so that companies can store the, your details securely on your phone in apps that you already have. So for instance, you, you, you might download an app from say your utilities provider, your bank, your travel company, mm. your airline, your train ticket company. Uh, and Take me through this. So, I, so, I, so I download something from, um, from, from you know, British Airways. Yeah. And British Airways is, well, you know, fingers crossed, one day might buy our software that mm. stores your details on your phone instead of having to store it somewhere else. And, and what I call this is making your customer your data center from, from a company's perspective. So instead yeah. of running their own data centers where you hold the data, make your customer the data center. And if you as a customer are the data center of all your data, then you can conditionally um, give access to companies that need it instead of them holding it on on onto those details. Is, is the app on my phone, the EDF Energy app on my phone, mm -hmm. is, that, is that a node? And then EDF has a node? Ooh, that's interesting. So, so, so you don't have nodes on phones because the actual information is not stored on a blockchain anyway. So the actual information is never stored on a quarter node. Um, what you do store on the quarter node is EDF energies, security symbols and signature. So it's EDF Energy's public signature. So when, when, when you show it to someone, you'll see that this has EDF Energy's address or handle, um, as mm -hmm. well as their signature and a company can verify that that's actually true. Okay. So where does the quarter come in or where does the, where does the blockchain come in? So the blockchain comes in when you look at the quarter mainnet where and quarter mm -hmm. mainnet is the place where um, the signatures from EDF Energy would be kept. Um, and there are nodes running on the quarter network, say for instance, where um, these signatures are stored. Alternatively, companies can also create their own private network where they can store these signatures of, of um, digital files that they issue to their customers. So what happens then? So my phone, I provide mm -hmm. the data, like three bits of data out of five and the other five, the other two are blocked out. Mm -hmm. And then the app sends it to say your mortgage company, right? Like say you're yeah. applying for a mortgage yeah, and you share this digital file signed by EDF um, and you share like three out of the five fields. Um, your mortgage company receives this file and can read this information. It can see that the three out of the five fields that you've given to them. Um, mm. It can see that it's not been tampered. So, you know, you didn't go in and manually edit it. And it sees a signature on there uh, that says, this is the organization that signed it. What your mortgage company can then do is it can go onto the quarter network in this example and mm. check what the signature of EDF Energy is and if it matches the one on the digital file that you presented. If it's not a match, then it knows it's a fake. And if it is a match and it can see that the, uh, the other fields have not been tampered, then your mortgage provider has the assurance that, okay, um, this seems to be legitimate information that, 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 that has been checked by EDF Energy in the past. And so therefore they don't need to spend their own time, energy and money checking that same information or asking you to fill it out on a form. Is there a sector you see that's particularly open to, um, to adoption or? I think there's two areas. I think the hmm. one big one is fintech and finance. Um, hmm. And fintech and finance because by law, um, there's a lot of ID checks that these companies have to do and it's quite expensive to do it. It could be like, you know, say when you sign up for say a bank account, um, I, you know, a lot of banks online these days, they ask you to record a selfie um, mm. and then take a picture of say your passport or your driving license. And what they're doing there is they're actually going and checking with the driving license agency, if that's a valid driving license, for instance. 
Um, mm. The second thing they're doing is they're looking at the picture on your driving license and matching it to the biometrics of your face. So you, you for instance, you can't just take um, uh, somebody else's driving license and try to register. Um, in addition okay. to that, like you also need to check if a person, for instance, is on a terrorist watch list or is on um, a watch list for money laundering and things like that. So it ends up costing um, at least a couple of pounds and for maybe some of the more expensive checks, it could, it could cost like in double digit like pounds. Um, so it's expensive. And I, and I see that as one of the areas where ID works um, is one of the first sort of like in you know, a target areas that we're looking at. Um, yeah. So I think there's the second area is, and this is like, you know, much bigger and much more exciting where things like, like, travel and you know buying things online and shopping for yeah. things in person and even in in restaurants like you flash a loyalty card there's 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 thousands of these opportunities where it's it's a tiny sort of like amount of friction that you have in your daily life where you have to carry around these pieces of plastic and i, I and i think people will stop carrying that and and that's the second sort of area that we are also exploring and the quarter bit is only it, is where you run the attestation yeah so there's like two is, is that right there's two there's two parts to the solution mm -hmm. there's the individual mm -hmm. like, like me or like me or you we've got like the the company a company's app on our phone and then they would need to they would need to create something on their app that meant you could save these digital identity copies um they would need to have say a cdf you know, you EDF then have to um, get the digital identity, the same kind of the same standard digital identity copy. That's the one part, and then another part is how do we use that? Well, we're going to use that through Calder, and it's going to be through Calder that provides the attestation. Is that is that how it works, or does Calder do more than that? Would you like a job in our marketing department, Martin? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Because that is exactly right. Yes. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so and and exactly like that. There's there's a couple of other blockchains as well. There is a reason mm. why we settled on Corda as the ledger of choice. Um, it's, mm. it's something exciting that we have in the works that I can't really talk about yet. Oh. Um, but, but it's something to do with identity, isn't it? <laughs> yes. I bet it is. Go yes, away. I bet there it you is. Go. Imagine that. The <laughs> head of engineering <laughs> at ID Works. <laughs> I don't want to no. be in the newspapers tomorrow yeah. if I let you know, like, you know, the plans to run. But um, there is well, we a reason should, we why. We could play we... a game of zero knowledge proofs, couldn't we? <laughs> is it not this? You can just is keep on asking not... me what it's what it's <laughs> No, no. So on the quarter front, then, um, like who's got a node, and um, uh, uh, who would have a who 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 would have a node in you know in an example? So in this ex in this example, um, I don't so even think like you know the EDFs mm. of the world or the um, DVLAs of the world need to have a quarter node, um, which which is the part that I find um, really? a lot of um, quarter developers find confusing um, yeah. because. Uh, in a lot of quarter contexts, people are used to storing information on a quarter blockchain and all the parties involved are on the blockchain. Um, this happens to be one of those scenarios where you don't need to do that. Um, and, and, and so what happens is you, you can just have like five or six companies, which I think will be technology companies, for instance, like IDWorks that run nodes on the quarter network um that any company can talk to and publish the the attestations or signatures so it's it's not it's not a quarter node that edf energy is running in this example it's the quarter nodes that id works is running on quarter mainnet um id works and other companies we would have a common node that is shared by many companies running on the quarter mainnet so, so imagine there's like, say, five nodes run by digital ID companies, each keeping an identical copy of signatures uh, that, that these organizations have requested. And there can be hundreds or even thousands or hundreds of thousands of organizations um, that can speak to these five nodes, say, um, and, and publish their uh, signatures on there. These five nodes where the signature is stored is run a bit like a public utility. 
that anybody can access and anybody can publish to. Um, the, 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 the actual sort of business model is in selling to the enterprise companies like EDF Energy that mm. need the ability to read digital files from customers and need the ability to publish their signatures onto some kind of ledger. I tell you what, it's a big old elephant you guys are trying to eat, isn't it? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Right, Anka, I think that's about all we've got time for today. So thank you. Thank you so much. for that's been uh, an for... exciting chat as well. And uh, yes. if you do want to do come marketing for us, I'm sure we can have a chat. I'd love to. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Brilliant. All right. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks so much. Thank you for having me and thank you for, for this chat. Hopefully um, this, this explains to a lot of people what we're trying to do. Thanks for listening. You can follow me on Twitter to catch future episodes and all previous episodes can be found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts and YouTube. This show was made by yours truly, Martin G, edited by Tess Elation Shepard Smith, produced by Oscar 999999998 Bennett and was served up to you fresh from the basement. <laughs>